we spend 15 minutes? <laughs> Starting with Riley, right? No, Peter. No, no, no Peter. Not. Peter, okay. in the door at least. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't checked Facebook. <laughs> you know, I, I, Governor doesn't generally fire people via Twitter, so I think we'll be okay. Uh, for the record, I'm Peter Walk. I'm the Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, I wear lots of hats within the administration relative to climate change and transportation activities. Uh, I'm happy to talk with you about a, a range of pieces. Um, I understand uh, from talking to Michelle Boomhauer that there's interest in uh, the VW settlement monies and the bus pilot project that is, is moving forward. Um, and I understand that uh, Maddie's already reached out to some of our folks to poll uh, in kind of where that is um, and, and have a discussion around that topic. So I think that would be a really good one to have. Um, certainly we, um, as we've thought more about um, how we spend those, the, the, spend those resources in support of the overall objective, which is the reduction of NOx emissions uh, from heavy duty transportation and transportation generally, we think there's value in, in doing as much as possible to transform different sectors of the heavy duty world into electrification as much as possible. And there are opportunities to do that via um, not simply providing incentives for people to switch, but also helping businesses and organizations think through what that looks like and how it fits into their business model. So in some ways, a pilot project is more effective than simply giving out you know, 10 lump sums of money to people to, to change over vehicles, to help them actually think through mm -hmm. what does it mean for how they operate and what does it mean for uh, what, where they're, you know, how, how their operations run in order to integrate them and, and is, it, is there benefit to it? Is there, what are the unforeseen consequences? That's, that's been the idea behind the bus pilot as well and building on the work that BEIC did in Massachusetts to sort of understand what the challenges and what works well and you know, all those things that you know, it's not as simple as a swapping one bus out for another. Um, so I wanted to touch on those, uh, that piece. I think primarily you've, you're interested in the transportation and climate initiative uh, work that is, is going on. So I want to put that into sort of context and talk about where we are and what uh, what my role and others is within the administration in, in working on this. Uh, so the for the transportation climate initiative is a is a broad uh, group of of state stakeholders, um, state and the District of Columbia stakeholders. It extends the group extends from Maine down the eastern seaboard to Virginia, including D.C. Uh, so the group has already formed. The group has been uh, formed since 2010. Um, so this this is just, it's been a body that have gotten together to think through how do we make progress on issues related to emissions from transportation. What has been, what was announced in December, um, which Vermont is a part of, is the, is the sort of, I call it the two-gate process. There's, we are, we, the group that signed on agreed to go walk through the first gate and say, we're gonna look at what a cap and trade program for transportation emissions could look like and what its potential benefits and potential costs would be. And then uh, we would spend the next year working through those issues and try to develop a program. And then by the end of next year, or the end of this year, excuse me, uh, this, the individual states would decide whether or not they wanted to pursue that policy. Uh, it is somewhat aligned with the work that we've done on the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is Reggie, if you may hear thrown around, which is the cap and trade for the power production sector. Um, we, it is most of the same states, but not all of them. Some of them are, are new in TCI, some of them are different. It, 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 it isn't just the energy and environmental folks as it is in, in Reggie. It includes the transportation folks. So uh, that's been a, a, a great addition. Obviously, we need, we need sort of uh, the agencies of transportation at the table to have the discussion be effective. But it also means we have new people to sort of think through lots of, uh, lots of new topics. Um, so that is the general framework that we're operating under. Uh, what we are doing now as part of the administration is, is sort of 
uh, and we, in discussions with other states, it's sort of figuring out what the decision-making process over the next year is going to look like. What are the pieces of data we need to know in order to make decisions on what the program looks like or would look like, uh, so that we can then um, do um, some economic modeling to see what the impacts are going to be, and then uh, have an opportunity for stakeholder engagement through that process to sort of to, to provide feedback and then sort of come back to the table with all, everyone together to say, okay, based on what we've heard, what is you know, the general consensus on how we would move this forward? And then, then at that point, then the, the, the decision making point would come. Um, so it's, uh, if that sounded convoluted and, and like a lot of things to do in a year, it is. It, you know, it sounded good in a press release, it scares the crap out of me. <laughs> Uh, there's just a lot of work to do. There's a lot of pieces to a cap and trade program that are complicated. If we don't get them right, then we have to go back and fix them. And more importantly, it has impacts on real people. And um, as I you know, like to say, generally speaking, when we try to get something right in the policy realm, we usually get it wrong. It's a question of how wrong we are. And we need to be able to make changes and fix things as we go. But it's nice to get it relatively uh, close the first time. And that is a, certainly a challenge with uh, working with this many states to try to figure out where the, the sweet spot is for all of them. Because they all have different needs. You think about different, different states have different sort of traveling profiles. Um, and we have, we and some of our other you know, colleagues have more rural, long distance travel profiles that, you know, where with you know, fewer opportunities now for public transit and things like that, that, um, that we are certainly uh, factoring in. Um, and so within that process, not only will what the sort of structure of the program looks like, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of cap and trade in concept in a second so that it doesn't just sound like jargon to you. Um, but the, and then also whether or not the, the group is going to have a, a shared position on how those, the investments from those proceeds occur. For example, Reggie, uh, the, red, the agreement that established Reggie requires each state to invest at least 25% in sort of virtuous cycle sort of investments in efficiency or other things. We have invested all of those proceeds into thermal efficiency work. 25% um, At least 25% of the proceeds that come to the state from Reggie from all, to all of the states have to be spent on uh, things. So, uh, whereas in New Hampshire, much many of the proceeds go back directly to ratepayers. Uh, there is a you know required proportion that some of that goes to to efficiency work or to other things that drive down emissions. From so, another clarification. Yep. Uh, so the so-called auction, mm -hmm. when um, utilities submit, I guess, a proposal of how to spend money in auction. Right. Uh, so is that Richie? That's in, that, that, that has in sort of. Uh, so let, let me step back and talk about what a cap and trade is okay. generally. So um, a cap and trade is a sort of hybrid model of regulation to get reductions in some pollutant that we're looking for. It was used it to to look at uh, SOX and NOx for for large power plants. We were talking about acid rain. Um, it has been used in Reggie, it's been used in other places for different, for different pollutants. It's a way to say, basically say what our overall goal is, is the reduction of this pollutant <coughs> from the environment. We are somewhat agnostic about whether you do it, or you do it, or you do it, as long as, as, long as it gets done. And if, and if you can sell, you can do it more cost efficiently than you can, then you can buy those allowances from him, from him in order to be able to move it forward. So uh, that's the sort of basic concept is, is to say, how can we harness market efficiencies to, to get the same result that we want without saying each one of you has to reduce your pollutant output overall by the same amount? Because we know not everybody can do it the same, and so we want to make sure that we get the result while um, getting it done and efficient. The, the way it works in Reggie, and Reggie is somewhat simpler and easier to understand, is that um, if you are a, a generator of electricity, 
you are required to, at the end of a three year period, hold enough what we call allowances. So one allowance equals one uh, ton of carbon. So if you, you have to hold enough allowances and submit them to A&R to match what your emissions profile is. You, we have whole quarterly auctions where people can, where emitters or anybody else for that matter can buy allowances in the auction. We auction a certain amount. Um, and then there's what we call a secondary market where if you are realize all of a sudden your emissions are way lower than you thought they were gonna be, then you can sell those in the secondary market. Or if you, are, you realize that you need more, you can also buy those in the secondary market. And that's where that sort of trading comes into play. Um, and what we're we doing that today with electric We're utilities. doing that with electric utilities. CO2. Yes. And we did that with SOX and NOX criteria for these? Who uh utilities? Not well, it, I think it covered all I would have to go back and look specifics, but I think it covered all industrial sectors. We didn't do it through an auction process then. We did it simply through that, that, that's one of the other options is to simply allocate the allowances uh, based on current emissions. And if you can do it better than you can trade within your, so if we think the, the auction model creates more financial incentive for people to work faster. Um, so, um, and, and that's the approach that's been taken with Reggie and has been effective at, at reducing emissions and keeping the price impacts on consumers low. That's not how we got uh, on action. Yep. Is, is that, that's, I, I don't think that's how we got uh, SOX reductions from Midwestern uh, coal power plants, is it? That's, that that it was is. cabin trade that was done, used to, yeah. So, um, it, it's, a, it's a tool that, that allows, you know, if, if you, you know, let's go back to the coal, coal power, coal fire power plants, if you are, a brand new facility that you know can optimize quickly and reduce socks quickly versus an older system that you know is going to take more time and more money <coughs> there's the, the economic efficiencies of one reducing their emissions faster is more than the other and, and then they can work together to to sort of balance that load um, when we're talking about, and when we're talking about pollutants where the specific geographic distribution of them isn't as critical um, when we're talking about an overall problem that gets up in the atmosphere. Then it becomes it, it, it's a it's a it's a worthwhile solution to consider. I, I, I did not know that. I, I thought that when the overall EPA just finally told the West Alpine yeah. utilities that they had to cut their sulfur emissions yeah. by X amount. It's always, it's always good to have learning together. I feel you know, I learn, learn new things about this all the time. Um, anyway, so so this is that's the the process that we are undergoing right now uh, is to figure out specifically what does the program look like, and that means just to, you know from a basic level saying what is the you know initial cap going to be, and the cap sets the overall emissions that that we think is acceptable for uh, to, to to happen, and then it, it ratchets down over time. So we get that <laughs> incremental emission decreases over time. And setting that initial cap and how quickly it, it, it goes down is the is sort of the key driver of what the policy will look like. But it also, there are also other pieces in there. We, we usually incorporate some sort of uh, price ceiling, so if, if the cost is getting too high, the more allowances can come into the market, therefore it's sort of stabilizing things so that we don't uh, put too much of a burden on on the overall system. There's also something we've installed and in, put into Reggie now we call an emissions containment reserve. If the price gets too low, <coughs> then allowances are pulled out of the market in order for it to come back in April. Because um, what we saw in what we've seen in Reggie in the last ten years is that the the cap was set too high, and we lowered it once, and then we've been rushing down again. And yet there are still additional unspent allowances in the system. There is what we call a bank of allowances.
allowances where people didn't need them. And, and that creates inefficiencies in the market because people can kind of come in and go, go as they, maybe it also uh, means that potentially down the road, those allowances could be used and we could end up with emissions higher than we'd like to see them to sort of get a little like hockey stick effect uh, to emissions. So it's how we deal with all of those factors within the marketplace really matters. And, and it's a, and so those are the sorts of things that we need to work on. So you can go back and and say, oops, we we put the cap so too high, and then we go we do what if if we follow the Reggie model, we have what we call a program review, uh, where we all the states get together every few years and say, all right, what's working, what's not, what needs to be adjusted, and we go through. We, that's a stakeholder process where we go out with various iterations of proposals that the utilities, that other interested parties, that, you know, that uh, folks who are looking after ratepayer interests, all those things can comment on to say what, you know, what they believe the impact should be and where we should focus our efforts. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have just completed the most recent Reggie program review and are undergoing uh, the regulatory process to adjust those now. The other thing to bear in mind about Reggie is that it's not a compact. It's not a group of states that are acting as one. It is a group of state programs that are linked and functioning cohesively. So we each have the same or very, very similar <coughs> set of either laws or regulations on the books, and then we share the auctioning and overall management services. So we are not a compact that would require uh, congressional support, and we don't believe that that likely to happen. Um, and it's it's worked out reasonably well, but it means we all have to come together and, and reach agreement on everything. So it is a complicated process. But the benefit to Vermont is that we are one creating a competitive environment throughout the region, and we are we are seeing greater reductions overall across the region than we could achieve through action in Vermont. And so while it is a somewhat deliberate and at times frustratingly slow process, it is incredibly effective at delivering greater scale of reductions and emissions than we would see from Vermont alone. Um, so do you have a position on the board for who, who makes those decisions? So there is a board. There are two representatives from each state so it is a uh, member of the PUC or equivalent for each state, and then the and then a somebody from the environmental agency from the state. So for Vermont, it is Sarah Hoffman from the PUC and me. And uh, uh, does Park States have no more? No. Well, New York kind of has a screwy situation where they have three, but it doesn't really matter because. They, we all have to come to agreement. They don't get to outvote us with their third member, and so it doesn't really matter. It's just they they have a larger organization that yeah. So, uh, Barbara, um, I'm just curious. You kind of opened with the talk about the both right and settlement and the bus pilot program. I just wondered, kind of. I think we were looking at where the monies had been and the different pots. And yep. I just wonder if that's something you were. I, I can happily speak to what I know about that. I don't know all of it, so I can say what well, I can do. We're trying to piece know. it together so I, you can find yourself. <laughs> so I can, I can, lead, I think I can probably clear up the things that you already know, unfortunately. But um, certainly, there <laughs> have been multiple settlements with the VW Corporation and its associated entities over the past few years. There have been two environmental settlements and one consumer protection settlement. The, there is a state environmental uh, settlement that was the $4.2 million that, uh, that the, we announced, I think, in April of 2017. Um, uh, the legislature appropriated that money to fill a, uh, a pending gap in the environmental contingency fund, which is what the what ANR uses to address emerging uh, contamination issues like in Bennington. Um, we, it's where we pay for state shares of Superfund program, Superfund cleanups. It's an incredibly important tool that enables us to respond quickly in the event of of a contaminant appearing in a in a place where it should not be. Um, that 
the second settlement was the federal environmental settlement, which is the $18.7 million that you often hear about. That is, has, it, it comes, it is, that one is a little bit more tri trickier because there is a trustee that holds that money. You as a legislature, at our request, appropriated 10%. We have 10 years to, to spend that money. So you appropriated 10% of those funds for us last year, and we were asking for another 10% this year uh, to spend on, to essentially go forward and, and ask the, um, the trustee for to release those funds. Um, the third, the, and then there was a, consumer, a state consumer protection settlement that was just announced this past June um, that I, I can't remember the full amount because a portion of it went directly back to consumers, but the state, the portion that went to the state was $3.6 million. You appropriated that in FY19 to the general fund, and I don't know where it precisely went from there. Um, and and so the, the piece, and then there is there have recently been settlements with Bosch and with Fiat Chrysler around similar issues relative to uh, essentially emissions cheating scandals. It's not they have they were not on the scale of uh, of VW, but certainly Bosch was providing some of the technology that enabled that cheating to occur, and uh, and Fiat Chrysler was doing similar things to what VW was doing. So it doesn't answer your question in full, but I hope that helps a little bit. And the bus pilot that you may just alluded to is, yeah. you want to expand on that? So that, that is coming from the $18.7 million. As you'll recall, as we talked about, I think you heard from Megan O'Toole a lot last year about uh, that, that money has specific confines associated with it. 15, up to 15% of it can go to like vehicle charging stations, or uh, charging infrastructure generally. Uh, often called EVSE or electric vehicle support equipment, in case you hear that acronym thrown around. That essentially means it's not just charging stations, it could be hydrogen fueling stations and other things that count as sort of in that in that world. Um, those that that money we plan is we and you I think all agree that that 15% appropriately should be spent. Uh, we have been out for one round of, of proposals already, and I believe it's going to be announced soon, the results of, of that. And, and I can safely say that we've received much more interest than we had resources for in the first round, which is encouraging. The communities and businesses and organizations are, are really looking to put charging stations in place. But it's also important as we think through these issues to make sure that, that we as the state play the gap filling role. Um, one of the major needs is is in the fast charging network um, to help people really get around the state that, that is more of the sort of gas station equivalent model. And there are parts of the state where it's not going to be economic for somebody to install one anytime soon, and that's where the state can play a role. Um, and I think it's an, an important role. Um, so that's. Thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm trying to keep it on the forefront that it never gets overlooked, that there is great concern that electric vehicles don't give those pennies to the infrastructure that gas-powered vehicles currently do. We haven't figured out how to, how to be an incremental tax that isn't annually, we say you drove this many miles, and now you've got this huge bill, but that as you're filling your car, you give us a couple dollars towards the bridge and the road. And I. I just hope that doesn't get lost as the transportation voice now joins what was just climate-oriented voice. Absolutely, and I think you will hear some from Riley about that next. Actually, you'll hear a lot about it because that's part of what the PUC proceeding is looking at now, which is exactly, and it's not, you know, it's, it's let's get past the sort of free rider discussion and get to what does our transportation look like, system look like in the future, and how does it pay for it, right? It, if, if our equivalent of the gas tax is, you know, is what, how we pay for the network now, what does that look like when we're not selling gas yeah. in such great volume? So that's, I think that's a great discussion, and one Riley will go into more detail on. Thank you. Mark? So uh, my, my concerns are, or my question uh, is really the inverse, because I think we, we heard um, from the colleagues sitting behind you the financial impact of 
the EVs that are on the road today is about two hundred thousand dollars estimated, and the impact of efficiency and as vehicle efficiency goes down, far more than ten times that. So, what I'm really looking at, though, and my concern is that the policies that we have in place now aren't connected to the greenhouse gas reduction emissions that we have. They're not connected. There's no clear path between the policies we have today and getting to the 2025 comprehensive energy plan, or especially not getting further out. So I'm wondering if you think um, that uh, TCI will allow us to get to a place where we can connect those policies. And one of the, the biggest things that I'm, that I'm focused on this year and want to learn more about, especially in light of what your Climate Action Commission um, recommendations were, is that um, we're excited to, at, about the EV incentive proposal and concerned that it's only maybe going to be two or 300 grants that come out of that, which is you know going from a couple thousand cars to 2,500 cars. Um, when we've got goals that say we should be looking at something like 50,000 cars being in the fleet in five years. And so I'm just wondering if you think TCI can help us drive that and, and, and if we're really going to meet this in our goals and if it would be helpful for us as legislators to drive that connection between our greenhouse gas reduction policy and the policy that we have around TCI and our participation. So you pretty much went to the heart of the point of the discussion. Um, I will answer it in a few ways. We don't necessarily know exactly what TCI is going to look like because we could create a program that everybody could agree to that had a cap that was too high that didn't go down in any sort of meaningful trajectory and it wouldn't produce the results we want to see. We could have the inverse where we <coughs> drove it down to the point where we couldn't actually meet any of those things and it was a drag on the economy and on individual repairs. That there's a sweet spot in the middle, but we don't know what it's, that's going to look like. So, but that is generally the idea, right? Is to, is to align a cap trajectory that that ha that meets matches our goals and is done in a way where we, based on the economic model that we do, we can kind of see what the impact's going to be. And there's a, a spot in there that that makes sense. So I'm not, I, I don't have an answer for you because I don't. I, I, it's hard to know what the specifics are. But there's the potential for it to work, and there's the potential for it not to work. Um, it certainly is. Um, and then to your to your broader question about what can you do to 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 sort of help help to, to show your intent and and, and, and push this along, um, I think there's a couple of things that I would ask. One, I, you know, certainly um, you the legislature has already uh, provided the administration past administrations. I can't remember when the law was put on the books to advocate for. Uh, regional compacts around uh, emissions generally. We are operating sort of under that authority now. Um, there is also, um, so, so, so that's there. So in terms of if we were to need anything to, to be able to negotiate, there isn't anything that we need. Um, I think the, the thing that I worry about, if you were to weigh in, is there are lots of pieces to this that are going to be give and takes with the various states. If we say in Vermont we need it to look like this, and it, I can come back with a solution that looks like this but gets us to the same general result, what do I do there, right? Because if I can't deliver this one, then I'm not going to comply with your directive. But it, but if I, so I can't come to agreement with the other states on this because you've told me to do something else. And so there are lots of different ways that, that we can set the various framework of the program to reach roughly the same emissions reductions and do it in such a way that, that meets different constituencies needs and each of the states brings a different, slightly different perspective in this um, and kind of what they can what they what's supported in their communities and what's supported, um, and so it's but it's a. <laughs> I would just ask, so that my my ask is essentially, if you're going to show your su support, do it in a way that doesn't ask for specific outcomes. To more of a, uh, have an evaluation process of the outcomes, at the end to say whether they're acceptable. I guess that would be more of the approach that I would recommend. Okay. I'm, 
going to ask a similar question that yeah. and I wasn't thinking of what might be a directive, but rather authority. That do you feel uh, you need any more uh, authority, or at some point you probably will when the so, is the street? But, uh, so I, I, I don't think we need any more authority now. Um, I would look to legislative council to see if they have any uh, additional thoughts on that, but we feel pretty confident that we have the ability to do what we're doing now. The way it worked with Reggie was the sort of the initial year, uh, the legislator put some sort of broad parameters on the program and then gave us rulemaking authority to do the rest. Uh, I could see something similar to that happening again. Um, obviously, there will need to be a discussion about it, the revenues that are generated and where to appropriate those. So, it, you know, if that were, if, if, if we were to move forward with the program, then obviously that's a discussion that we'll need to have in this building next year and many other years. Well, if you're able to and willing to, I'd like to hear about a scenario of what we might be looking at. And I know this is going to be another place where it is an example of the difficulty uh, with transportation mm -hmm. and CO2 emissions because mm -hmm. you know, Reggie was mainly dealing with enormous power plants and there aren't that many of them. Yep. And the public doesn't, you know, we, we use them every day, but we're pretty far from that, right. and the regulation of that. Uh, uh, and that's really the, the problem, the difficulty you know, with transportation versus uh, the electric uh, industries, especially when we're talking about utilities. Can you share with us possible scenarios of what, what this might look like, and then tell us how it would be affected? Sure. Um, I can try. So one of the questions is always sort of how does how does a it, depending on where we put the point of regulation, which is one of the questions, right? Is it some sort of upstream wholesaler or distributor or refinery level? Right, where exactly does that fall? Which fuels are covered? Um, because there, while well, Vermont doesn't have uh, robust port infrastructure, uh, other states in the region certainly do and are certainly interested in whether or not those are covered. Um, so it's where where does that take out? And so so those are some of the sort of general pieces. So depending on on where it was, you sort of hit the nail on the head that it, it's going to be upstream as it is with the utilities, but the utilities are also the generators at that point as well. We are all the generators of carbon emissions from transportation. Um, so in trying to figure out what it looks like for a um, for whoever the regulated entity is to comply in a cost-effective manner might be switching to more, you know, sort of carbon or less carbon intense fuels whether that be things like compressed natural gas or other things, whether it's you know, renewable, you know, biodiesel and other and other things, there are opportunities to comply that aren't simply selling less gasoline and diesel, um, sort of um, fossil fuel-based gasoline and diesel, and so they, it's hard to know exactly what will happen because we we weren't expecting some of the innovations that occurred in the power production sector and we got way more of that than we were expecting. And so that may happen that that once once the signal's in place that this is where we intend to go as a region, then we'll see some of that sort of innovation that, innovation that technology. The tool. Yes. Yeah, you, you, I mean that's that's and for the T T C I discussion certainly. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss the salient point of what you just said, if I'm hearing it right, is that when we did cap and trade with Reggie, it drove more innovation than we expected and drove down to the greenhouse gas emissions of our electricity. So the, the combination of, of innovation and honestly cheap natural gas is a huge factor in that. Um, and the, the reinvestment of proceeds into efficiency work so that we were using less energy has led led to Reggie being way more effective and way cheaper than than we originally thought it would be. Alan. So if you were in a, a world where you could have a group of a TCI, uh, would each, could each state 
to determine where it wanted to invest the proceeds. So there, I mean, so could that's you say, well, we want to invest in, uh, you know, electric vehicles, and somebody else wants to invest in motorization or something like that. I I think that that it, we we as the executive branches of all of these states recognize that we don't have the authority to say where we're going to invest it. That's your job. Uh, we can make recommendations. I think there probably will be a statement of principles around where we think it should be in this. And I think that will include everything from electrification to public transit to especially things that are focused on sort of how do we make this an equitable transition. Um, I think it will also focus in on how do we make our transportation infrastructure more resilient. Right? We know that uh, the transportation network that we have now is subject to the devastation of climate change related events. How do we make investments that move those those investments forward and, and reinvest in the system in a way that is survivable of for um, climatic events and 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 that can come in everything. But I don't think it'll be prescriptive to the point of saying you will spend fifteen percent on E V instead of spend so we would that say, okay, there's X you know, so many million dollars in allowances. That would be a legislative decision. Oh, and that there would be X number of dollars from the allowances, and then that would be a, a legislative decision about where to where to uh, allocate that. Correct. Robert. Well, just a little bit of an alarm bell went off when you spoke to the cheap natural gas being a key component yep. prior, because I think there's some concerns that maybe the full cost of that hasn't been paid for yet. But there's some I, concern for the infrastructure. So I just want us to be a little bit cautionary about what might be available as dollars when we're talking about. I I don't disagree with you. Um, I'm just conveying yeah. what what the no. facts on the ground. Is no, why, I appreciate why that. It so, exactly. Why it was it was easier, right? Yep. And with the technology was available and we went further, but there right. was the the cheapness of natural gas and the availability of it yep. was was a huge part of the success of the program. You were finished with what you wanted to tell us, right? I, I, I am, yes. certainly. Okay. I'm, I, I'm just, I, I know it's complicated. I imagine we'll have to have more than one conversation about this, but I just wanted to sort of bring up the sort of basics of where we are, and I'm happy to come back yeah, uh, when I know more about sort of what the process is going to be. We're meeting at the end of this month down in D.C., all of the states together to sort of hash out the process um, about decision-making and Mike and then Mary. Um, and then David? Yes. Representative Burks uh, mentioned motorization made me want to ask, and I think I know the answer to this, but the boundaries of what's going to be discussed are around forming TCI are really going to be focused on the transportation and energy sector and not. That has been the nature of the discussion since 2010. Right, right, not the other unregulated fuels that we have in Correct. Vermont. For Isn't the T for transportation? Yes. <laughs> transportation and climate initiative. Right. Or to spell the acronym. Um, I can't remember, but just Reggie, and this is, I know we're about TCI, not Reggie, but um, do they include the methane emissions at the source of natural gas? Uh, I don't believe so. I would have to go, but I think it's I think it's simply the, the emissions from the burning of the, so I, I but I, I, I would need to ask. I can, I can find that out and get back to you. Okay. Dave? So, kind of new to Reggie. Yeah. I don't know what you said today. But, so I'll ask kind of a global question. Does, uh, is Vermont a net gainer in these negotiation processes? Yeah, with, is Vermont a net gainer with regard to uh, Reggie as it's been formulated and ongoing? Do we get We money? We are in Reggie, for sure. We, we gain more than we put into the system. That's without a doubt. The transportation system is a little more complicated because our our miles driven per capita is higher than our use of electricity per capita in a general sense. Um, but so it all depends on how we negotiate what the sort of who gets what out of the system, and that's why you know that's where the horse trading really comes in, and that's where the flexibility of my negotiators comes in to be able to say. I can live with this piece if I get more of a share of the proceeds. And there are states that are more interested in the outcome than they are in the proceeds because they're getting so much of it that you know, it doesn't matter. But for us, 
we're a we're a rounding error in, in Reggie, and it will be a roughly a rounding error here too. And want to make sure that we are our proceeds a match that we can reinvest. So um, we really don't know what's going to happen with uh, these negotiations nope. and transportation, but let's just uh, hypothesize that we, we are a net gainer in uh, these negotiations. Yep. And so how, how is it anticipated that we would, would pay for uh, that deficit? Do you get the, yep. the gist of it? I, I do get that question. So it, it, it won't be a sort of a, there won't be a bill for the state that comes due at the end of it. The, uh, the costs associated with will be be sort of an, on an ongoing basis. And it depends on how much revenue we bring back in and what we do with it to sort of figure out what the overall impact is. Um, and I think if we come back and we realize that it's, it's really not a great investment for the state of Vermont, and that's where the hard decision making comes in as to whether or not it's an appropriate, the appropriate mechanism. It's, this is not a foregone conclusion. This is to say, this might be a policy that could work, but we need the details to be able to make that decision. So, uh, you kind of still didn't answer the question. You helped a little okay. bit, but so how would we actually pay for it? So the that's a policy decision. Yeah. Well, so it, it the way the way it works, we're, we all pay for it with Reggie, right? The the cost that the allowances that the utilities have to buy, you know, they are going to defer that cost down to their ratepayers eventually. We don't the the overall effect on bills across the region has been negative. That we are all paying less for electricity because of <coughs> Reggie because of the efficiency work that's happening. So. The actual impact on the bills across the region is is a good one for positive economic piece. It's a, it's taken care of way back at the wholesale level. Yes. So tell us how it would work. So with that would be the, that would be the same sort of thing that the wholesaler would pay the cost and pass that cost on to the consumer. In and terms of like gasoline. Yes. In terms of the fuels that we're, we, we, yeah, we would cover, oil. well, not as considered now, heating oil wouldn't be part of that. This is a conversation that's only been about transportation. So that was, that was my question, Dave. It's, it's, it's the challenge for transportation because we don't have a, trans, a few transportation utilities in the state. So, one of us. so kind of like with Reggie. We, we the average guy, don't really even understand or fig figure these, uh, sense these calculations uh, with regard to our electric. It just appears in our electric bill and we pay it yeah. and yeah. we don't think much about it. As yep. And so you're saying that it's going to happen somewhat that way uh, with it regard would be, to you would, you, you would simply prices. see it in the cost of, of, yeah. of electricity. And we're not going to be keeping track of it on we could, weekly basis. We probably, we, I don't think we would really ask a wholesaler to figure that out, right? That's a calculation they need to do as a business to be competitive and to, to, to cover their costs. But it's not something I think we, we would try. I mean, we could, it would be something to consider. I think the other um, sort of broader piece is that the difference between, so there's a sort of the carbon pricing models that are typically out there and the tax where government sets the price and hopes for emissions reductions accordingly. The cap sets the, the emissions reductions we want to see and lets the price respond to what the market can meet. And that's the, the benefit of, of the cap and trade approach is that generally speaking, the prices are lower and you also guarantee the emissions results. So you, to me, for me as a regulator who's concerned about the pollutants going in the air, I want to see us meet our goal and do it as efficiently as possible. And if we can't do it in a such a way that's efficiently, then we need to have a different discussion about how, how that should work. How long have you been doing this? Uh, let's see. I have been working on Reggie issues since 2013 when I worked for the state of New York before coming home to work on it here. So. Uh. Okay, Mary? Um, so, what? 
What has happened since to bring, I mean, it's been nine years since you got together. Yep. So. Uh, well, I, I wasn't around for the first, uh, I, I wasn't involved much in DCI in New York, so I don't know a lot of what happened in year between 2010 and 2017. Uh, but I think that the, the, the delay has been mostly a reflection of, of all of the issues that you've been raising about how exactly do we get those emissions reductions, right? It's, it's easier when it's large point sources for them to make one, in, you know, one series of investments and get large reductions. When it's an individual choice for all of us on how we drive, what we drive, if we drive, um, that, that's a more complicated discussion, I think. The, the, the conversation in 2010 wasn't advanced that far. EVs really weren't on the market in a meaningful way at that point. And so there wasn't a technological solution to for the vast majority of Vermonters or folks around the region that was cost effective. Um, and so we've come along, the technology's come a long way, that there are options that are out there, and I think that's helped make it to that, get to the point where there is enough sort of broad-based support for for acting in this sector that that it, you know it, it, that's why the progress has been made more. Okay, uh, Molly, you need to. Um, just a question. About, well, So it is. It, so that? it's a complicated system. We we have Reggie's been effective in the in the electricity world. We probably wouldn't. We can you can join different sectors of WCI. You don't have to join the whole program. WCI Western Climate Climate Initiative covers all sectors of the economy. So transportation, building, heating, industrial uh, energy use, and the electric sector, uh, among other things. Um, but. So we probably wouldn't do Reggie. So it would create a price distinction. Right now, the price for Reggie is, uh, I can't remember what it is, but it's a, basically a third of what the price in, in WCI is. And WCI hasn't actually really addressed many emissions from the transportation sector because of the cap at this point, because they're still getting all of their efficient emission reductions from, from the power production sector, because that's where it's easiest to get them from. As we've seen with Reggie, so they're essentially on the same path we are. Um, the the generally transportation fuel folk have been able to be net buyers of allowances and complied in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So so while they have used money of the proceeds associated with their cap and trade to invest in programs that cover all fuel types, the actual reductions as a result of the cap have primarily been from. There has not been a discussion within TCI about the group as a whole about joining WCI, primarily because I think most people think the price is, is higher than, than their communities would be willing to accept. And what's WCI? Western Climate Initiative. It's the, it's the California and Quebec. Oh, okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Steve, so now we have Riley. And, and an electrical engineer is with you? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so, Molly, uh, Brian, and Dave, I hope you don't mind that sometimes I, I just need to interrupt you to remind you to speak to the whole committee. It's, I used to sit right there, Brian, and I did it every time I had a question, so I don't expect you to remember, but please don't mind if I remind you. Because Not at all. You tend to get into a conversation with the witness. Yeah. And you get softer and softer yeah. as you're just chatting you with them. You used to sit at that end, so yeah. I know yeah. exactly what you And I used to sit right there, so yeah. I know I do. So. And I've never sat here. So. <laughs> <laughs> You'll figure it out. I don't know why Molly does it. She's like, no. She does <laughs> yeah. and Jared, I'm sorry I got out without uh, you officially releasing me. I hope that's all right. <laughs> No, I, I said thank okay. you. That's what I meant. <laughs> That's <sufficient. laughs> thank you all. Thank <laughs> 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 you.
<clears throat> so I'll just uh, say for the record, my name is Riley Allen. I'm a Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Public Service. Uh, with me is uh, Bill Jordan. He's our head of the engineering department at the Department of Public Service. And uh, in the back of the room is Dan Potter, uh, who's uh, with our planning group. And <clears throat> I think he gave this presentation last year. So I, I stole some slides from him. Uh, so I uh, credit to him for, for that. Uh, I do have paper copies. I, I wasn't sure if you know, there was electronic. But you, you have paper copies if you, for those of you that would like it. So I'll just kind of pass this one. Pass this one. Thanks, what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get them line right now, so I need one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 This is the first time I've testified this year before this uh, committee. Um, uh, I, uh, I'll just say a, a few things about myself just to orient you a bit. Uh, so I am a deputy commissioner. I've been kind of on and off with the department for uh, more than 30 years in, in different positions uh, throughout. So I'm fairly familiar with the, the regulatory uh, scene. And with uh, electricity uh, regulation, uh, uh, Bill Jordan has also been uh, around a while and uh, will help with uh, some engineering uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> also worked for a number of organizations uh, in, in Vermont and, and overseas uh, doing some work in, in Africa on uh, regulatory issues. Um, <clears throat> so I'll walk through uh, the slides so I have control over this. Uh, I just wanted to let you know what I, I plan to cover in the, in the presentation. I think I have around 40 minutes or 45 minutes. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I want to talk about the, uh, start with a discussion of the goals that we have that are relevant to uh, transportation. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, status of electric vehicles uh, in the state, where we are and kind of making progress uh, rel relative to our transportation initiatives and electric vehicles. I want to touch on the uh, Public Utility Commission investigation. There's an investigation into kind of electric uh, vehicles. Uh, the legislature last year asked for uh, the Public Utility Commission to help kind of advise on some policy uh, issues, and I'll just update you on, on that a bit. Uh, Transportation fund that came up in the prior uh, uh, question. That's uh, an issue that's before the Public Utility Commission. They're asking questions about that. The department uh, is working with our sister agencies. We have a position that uh, you know we think is relevant that uh, I can speak to and kind of speak to the options that the commission is uh, considering for addressing the, the funding uh, issues. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about the uh, load forecast, um, uh, part of the concern might be that, gee, th these are potentially very significant new loads. What are they, they going to do to our grid and what are the implications? Bill is going to back me up uh, there um, if we get into some technical areas, but I feel like I can cover that as well. Um, and then I have some extra slides that are also relevant to the issue of uh, electric, uh, electric vehicles and grid integration. Uh, what I'm going to try to communicate uh, through that is with effective rate design, we can actually take what are flexible loads. Electric vehicles are immensely flexible loads, and we can kind of mold them to do good things. And that's, that's part of the message that I hope uh, I, I leave you with. So I remember that this transportation is really not energy and technology, so you just may want to okay. briefly explain some of these. 
concepts. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll go into the level of detail. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the next slide, which is slide three, uh, is just a list of the goals from our comprehensive energy plan. Uh, you may uh, hear uh, mention of the comprehensive energy plan from time to time. This is a plan that was adopted by the uh, department and uh, the then Shumland administration. Uh, and it articulated a set of goals and objectives, some of which are I think mirrored in statute, uh, some of which extend beyond statute. Uh, but the 90% by uh, 2050, you'll hear that mentioned a lot. That's a renewable objective. 90% of our total energy objectives would be met uh, by renewables by 2050. Uh, there's also a kind of a carbon related uh, overlay on that. The greenhouse gas uh, goal is 80 to 95%. Uh, below 1990 levels uh, uh, by 2050. I think there's a uh, goal also in statute that's 75% uh, uh, by, by 2050 relative to the 1990 uh, uh, levels. Here's a, uh, a visual that came from the Vermont uh, Climate Action Commission. Uh, Peter's gone, but uh, Peter uh, led that uh, initiative. It, it shows you kind of where we are uh, in terms of our, of our greenhouse gas emissions and some of the relevant uh, goals that we've set and um, uh, essentially what we need to do to essentially accelerate the, uh, our improvement or our, uh, our path in order to achieve some of these uh, goals. Um, uh, we've already missed one of those uh, goals. That was one that was uh, uh, in um, 2012, it was called for 25% below uh, 1990 levels, uh, and I think it was uh, yeah, in 2012. But we have other targets that are still in front of us that we're going to try to meet. Uh, so this is uh, this next slide on slide five is just to give you a sense of proportion. Uh, where is transportation in our? Uh, what is transportation uh, relative to other uh, energy? Uh, and use uh, demands in our overall uh, portfolio. In terms of the actual BTUs, transportation, at least according to the EIA data, is about 38% of our energy demand. Uh, in terms of energy expenditures, it's also about uh, 38%. Uh, uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, it's more like 43 or 44. I see different numbers. Uh, sometimes you'll see 47 percent, but it's it's a big. It's, it's where a lot of the opportunity is to um, make quick progress. Just a clarifying question on the prior uh, pie graphs. When you're looking at the dollars for energy, are you excluding the taxes, etc.? Because they're not all. I, I I'm just a little bit. Again, going back to the infrastructure component of what we spent yeah. for our transportation dollars, I'm not sure that, I'm curious if the energy includes that, or if it's... Well, I pulled this from EIA. I don't think they exclude the, uh, the taxes. I think they just kind of uh, do the math off the top and say, what are the energy expenditures? So I think these embed within in them any of the taxes that are associated with those yeah. different categories. So I, I guess I just want to further emphasize that as we look forward, when we're talking about the, the cost, and, and um, there, there's been an example given to the table that there's this wonderful discount on your what it costs you to fuel your vehicle when you uh -huh. use electricity. I, I think that we, we're removing also something that's being purchased. It's not an apples to apples. It's, no, I, it, I, it really needs to stay out there. Yeah, I, I have a slide, I think, that speaks wonderful. directly to Thank that. You. So I, I, think, um, I think we're covered. Uh, uh, so their uh, greenhouse gas, uh, major contributor, major factor. Uh, just to kind of reinforce that point uh, a bit, uh, it's covered in the comprehensive energy plan, the importance of kind of moving on transportation to make progress toward our greenhouse gas uh, objectives. But this is a report from the Energy Action uh, Network. They list a, a number of things that we need to do. You see the right, the very first item is 
electric vehicles and, and making progress on uh, transportation. That's really where there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, so now I'm going to get into the uh, second topic, which is uh, current status. Where are we? Um, as I'll show in the following uh, slides, there are actually uh, 614,000 uh, registered uh, vehicles in the uh, state, and we're at about uh, 2,800 electric vehicles uh, relative to, to that amount. So we're, we're still kind of at the very early stages of making progress in terms of moving our electric vehicle uh, fleet toward, um, uh, toward significant penetration within that sector. There is a uh, slide uh, to, to the right that is kind of uh, helps one to sort of understand the evolution of new technologies and how they enter as an S-curve there that shows uh, where you all are, are at, at different stages. We're still at the very early end of this. We're in the innovators uh, stage. We have the early adopters that are uh, even preceding the early adopters uh, mode of, uh, of entry there. Uh, it was just a couple statistics. Uh, vehicle registrations, this says 777,000 uh, uh, registrations, but this includes trailers and, and other things. Uh, the, I think the relevant number is probably 614 a uh, thousand uh, uh, kind of uh, roadworthy vehicles that are uh, out there that are, are registered. We drive about 7.3 billion miles uh, in, in, uh, in Vermont on our roads, and that's uh, a number that's increased uh, over time, but it's been you know relatively steady for the last uh, decade or two. We have about 200 uh, publicly available charging stations around the state. It's actually 209 now, um, but we need to make a lot of progress. Uh, I, I include this slide on, on number 11 because I find this interesting. It, it helps you to understand, um, or helps one to understand, uh, why it's such a challenge to make quick progress uh, with uh, the changeover in, in the fleet. Every year we all, we'll have uh, you know, a significant new tranche of, of vehicles, but uh, vehicles last a very long time. Electric vehicles may even last much longer than uh, internal combustion engine uh, vehicles, but you know, the weighted average life, I'm guessing, is something in the neighborhood of uh, 12 years, and this is the curve that shows you, you know, how, how they age and what has to kind of be displaced over time. There's still a significant number of vehicles that are still on the roads from uh, from uh, 2000 or 2000 in the, even the late 1990s. Uh, the next slide uh, gives you a sense of uh, the types of vehicles that we, we drive. Uh, we drive a lot of trucks. We drive a lot of all-terrain vehicles. Uh, we, we drive a lot of vehicles that can do well on, on our back roads and can carry cargo and uh, do other things. Uh, the top models include uh, uh, the Ford, Chevy, uh, Toyota, uh, Subaru. Uh, it's not until you get down to uh, Toyota Corolla that you get down to a kind of more standard uh, passenger vehicle uh, car. But looking forward, there's, there's kind of good news, which is um, there are new announcements of uh, electric vehicle models that are being introduced all the time. This happens to be a slide, it's actually from 2017, so in the intervening period there have been major new announcement, announcements from uh, General Motors, I think for 20 new models uh, that are coming out that are going to be uh, electric. You have uh, Ford has announced uh, some of its trucks are going to be um, 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 for plug-in uh, charging electric uh, vehicle. But what you see in this chart is the range of the vehicles and the models are, uh, are coming on from uh, a, a wide range of manufacturers. Touch on the uh, PUC investigation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Act uh, 158 from 2018 uh, required the Public Utility Commission to uh, conduct an investigation uh, with respect to electric vehicles. Uh, 
They're making good progress. Uh, they opened the investigation in July. On January 23rd, they issued a letter to the legislature with uh, their recommendations relevant to uh, some jurisdictional I issues. What should uh, the uh, jurisdiction of the commission and the Public Service Department be relative, relative to electric vehicles and their uh, recommendation is largely to exclude charging stations anyways from the, the jurisdiction. So we would retain jurisdiction over and the traditional utility apparatus uh, and their involvement in electric vehicle charging, certainly the charges that they uh, charge on the public charging stations, but um, not the charging stations themselves. Mary? Uh, just a quick question. What if some were in a bunch of um, the third phase three or three, whatever? Level three? Yeah, level three. Yeah. Um, what if that added a new peak? Um, so that that is that's a topic that I'll, I'll be covering uh, more extensively uh, later in, in uh, the, the conversation. Um, but some of the the high points are one we we actually have a, a lot of headroom in our, our system uh, currently, and I'll, I'll try to sh show that uh, graphically. Uh, it's important in my mind uh, that we we manage we send appropriate price signals and that we price uh, whatever. Um, system costs that uh, uh, fast charging stations or anyone else, frankly, uh, imposes on the system uh, and ensure that other, other non-participating rate payers are, are protected from that. So that's a rate design issue and that's part of the conversation as well. We do have demand charges and we do have rate structures that try to get at that. Uh, I, we, the department just issued a report uh, about a week ago it speaks directly to things that we can do uh, with demand charges or to address kind of that, that those peak challenges and opportunities going forward even better than we have in, in the past. So that's a, a, comp, a fairly complex rate design issue, but that, that report from Act 194 is uh, available on our website if anyone's interested in, uh, in the details there. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's the topic I love to talk about, and I could kind of geek out on that, but I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you go for now. Um, and uh, the rate design and EV charging and uh, the uh, transportation fund are topics that the commission is intending to uh, essentially help us with going forward. Uh, so uh, the department is working with our sister agencies, the Agency of Transportation and the Agency of uh, natural resources to essentially help uh, facilitate a sensible solution around the transportation fund. I think the monies that are collected through diesel and uh, gasoline sales, I think they're in the neighborhood of uh, $97 million, something like that. I'll defer to my colleagues from the Agency of Transportation on that particular issue, but I, I see that as kind of the reference point for, you know, as we move from electric vehicles to gasoline and diesel vehicles, uh, what happens to those ones and how, how do we kind of make those up? Uh, we think that uh, a sensible option, we being the interagency group and the Department of Public Service in our voice before the Public Utility Commission, uh, that we uh, place, you know, a fee or tax on uh, on the kilowatt hour sales. Uh, that is, uh, that there uh, be essentially a component of the uh, the, the uh, charge uh, to retail customers that help to uh, address the uh, the shortfall. Um, now you might say, uh, golly gee, uh, isn't that Problematic? Aren't we trying to encourage uh, electricity sales? Why would we really want to kind of put that uh, price there? And I'll, I'll get to the the reasons. <clears throat> but the good news is coming back to the issue of, of rate design <clears throat> is we, we think there's a lot of uh, a lot of room that we're going to create to uh, make that 
that possible. So the, what you see in the graphic in front of you, I'll get started by just uh, providing some, some reference points. Uh, on the right hand bar, you see essentially the cost per mile uh, for gasoline uh, that is uh, associated with uh, traditional internal combustion engines. It's pretty high. It's uh, in the nature of 12, uh, north of 12 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that green area on there, that is intended to reflect the transportation fund. That's, a, that's the tax that is essentially on the bill. And that's how much is uh, essentially flowing from that uh, uh, price of gasoline to pay for our roads uh, through the uh, uh, the fees or the taxes that are on gasoline and uh, and diesel. The middle bar, uh, the gray bar, is simply the retail price of electricity. So that's something in the neighborhood of 15 or 16 cents per kilowatt hour is is what we pay for uh, electricity currently. So if we we just flip from internal combustion uh, engine vehicle to an electric vehicle. There's a significant uh, savings in terms of the energy cost uh, per mile, uh, just moving from one to the other. Now, it varies uh, between systems. So in uh, Vermont Electric Co-op territory, that would be a much higher number. And in uh, Burlington Electric territory, that would be a lower number. But uh, on a statewide average, it's, it's something in the neighborhood of four cents per kilowatt hour. So it's 12 cents per kilowatt hour versus four cents uh, per kilowatt hour. N now, um, I'm here to tell you that we, act we actually can improve that, that further. Uh, what you have, because uh, electric vehicles represent a flexible load, that is, they have a huge uh, battery system uh, embedded within them, you can charge those vehicles uh, um, Pretty much, uh, you have an awful lot of flexibility. There's 12 hours a day where you have an awful lot of flexibility. Uh, I think the average person drives maybe uh, you know, 30, 35 uh, miles a day to get uh, to and from work, maybe uh, stop uh, at a shop or, or two. But there's not a lot of energy that's uh, typically associated with, with that uh, that would you know, uh, roughly equal uh, um, maybe uh, um, uh, maybe uh, four or let's see, four, uh, yeah, you know, eight or uh, eight or nine uh, kilowatt hours worth of electricity to essentially move that distance. It might be a gallon of, of gasoline, or it might be uh, a gallon and a half of, of gasoline. But uh, that's uh, that's the uh, you know that's the cost so you, to recharge that. You, you probably need in the neighborhood of uh, you know an hour or an hour and a half of, of uh, charging time. A typical uh, vehicle on the roads uh, is idle or is parked for 22, uh, sometimes more, more than 22 hours of the day. That's a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility there to choose when it is that we uh, we charge the vehicles. When they're plugged in, may be different than when they're actually charging. Uh, and that's kind of an important point. You may get home at the, uh, uh, from work at the end of the day, you may plug in your, your vehicle. It doesn't necessarily have to charge just at that time. It can charge you know, after 11 o'clock. Can, you can be on a time of use rate. It can uh, 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 pr provide you an incentive to start charging at 11 o'clock, at, at 12 o'clock. But you don't want to set a new peak at 11 or 12 o'clock either. If everyone starts doing that, that can be a problem as, as well. So you might want to implement some mechanisms that help you to kind of feather in that, that charging uh, at uh, 12, 1, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning. What you need to do is you need to cover that. That, that vehicle needs to be uh, uh, fully charged by 6 or 6.30 in the morning, the next morning when you're, uh, you're ready to go. And that's kind of the thing to be aware of um, generally. But what, what we that this left-hand bar here is intended to show is uh, that we have, <clears throat> at least from a, a system perspective, there's value that can uh, essentially be captured by managing those loads to the the system. So Green Mountain Power can benefit, Burlington Electric can uh, benefit, 
our other utilities can benefit because they can manage those loads around their monthly uh, um, uh, charges for the bulk transmission system, so the RNS charges. They can manage those loads around uh, high energy price times. They can manage those loads around the forward capacity market. And that has real value to Burlington Electric, uh, Green Mountain Power, and our uh, providers. And that is value that can be used and passed on to the retail consumer without harm to the system, um, uh, much deeper than, than even that gray bar uh, there, that 15 or 16 cents. Um, <clears throat> one of our utilities has already made some progress in this area. Um, they brought the rate down, essentially down to 8 cents a uh, uh, kilowatt hour. There's still a margin. There's still a contribution that is being made to the system through that rate, but it creates room to essentially uh, feather in or layer on that a tax, uh, if you will, or a fee to help cover that, that green bar, uh, which is the transportation fund. So if we can create a kind of a mechanism that further uh, further uh, creates an economic advantage, customer uh, economic advantage to move toward an electric vehicle, we have room to essentially layer in a charge to cover the transportation fund and the, uh, the revenues that would otherwise be lost uh, from the movement from uh, internal combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. I'll pause there. So I am so excited about this image of the future where we're using creative rate design in order to signal to people, you know, Beck and I work in solar, the sun is shining, I'm imagining getting a text on my, uh, to, that I can charge my electric vehicle at the lower rate because there's power locally. Like those kinds of things are, are so incredible and I'm so excited about this conversation. I'm wondering if you could tell us at what point in the adoption of electric vehicles, like how many electric vehicles do we need to get on the road before this kind of pricing model starts to make sense? And you may have heard my comments um, in Deputy Secretary, Secretary Walt's uh, presentation that I'm, I and I think other people on this committee are really concerned that like, like how do we get to the place where that makes sense from where we are right now, given the limited resources we have to kind of get the market to move faster? Well, it, it's, I mean, we can do it today. Uh, there's no reason we can't do it today. In fact, we have, uh, we have um, uh, at least one utility, Burlington Electric, that has essentially moved in this direction. We have another utility, Green Mountain Power, that is, uh, I think, um, interested and is engaged uh, around this topic. I think they're looking hard at uh, different ways to do it. It doesn't, I just want to be clear that it doesn't necessarily require the end user to essentially do something different. I, I don't need a text message from Burlington or from Green Mountain Power to motivate me to say, oh, gee, I better plug in the vehicle. I can come home, I can plug in that uh, vehicle, I can already have my uh, charging uh, infrastructure at home set up to automatically flow the electrons at that, that time. So. Uh, you know, I, I do, there's a software set up uh, potentially to respond to those price signals. I can do it on the dashboard of my car. It doesn't have to be through the charging equipment. Or I could uh, allow Green Mountain Power or uh, Burlington Electric. They will offer me potentially a discounted rate in exchange for their ability to kind of manage the flow. So they can feather in the, the loads at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning so that everyone isn't suddenly charging their, their vehicles at uh, 12 o'clock. In my world, you could have uh, other third-party entities actually uh, 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 playing a role in between the end user and the utility that is uh, acting as an agent either for the utility, the customer, or, or both, that is essentially uh, providing services that uh, are essentially analogous to what I've either the customer doing it on their own or the uh, company doing it on, on their part to further extend the reach of that, that flexibility. Uh, the goal being that essentially you want, you want most or almost all vehicles on a, a, some sort of a flexible charging plan, ideally without any inconvenience to end users. Riley, right, let's try to have you get through your slides. Okay. And we'll try to hold our questions to Okay, I, I apologize. I, I get a little excited about that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so uh, he, here's a, a, an example that happens to be kind of analogous to uh, what uh, Burlington Electric is doing to reduce food charge from about 15 cents down to 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, why a per kilowatt hour charge? We think it's, uh, it's there's a fairness issue. Um, uh, we think uh, it kind of reflects the impact, uh, the adverse impact of heavier vehicles on, on the roads. Heavier vehicles will consume more kilowatt hours, and so there's sort of a symmetry there. Uh, at parity with the gasoline uh, tax, it's, it's essentially what we're doing. We're just extending it to electricity. And by the way, out-of-state travelers also are cost causers for our, our road system. So if we can uh, if we can take it out of the registration system and impose it on kind of the uh, the volume of energy, uh, we're helping. They're helping to uh, contribute to the costs that they're causing. Um, how would it occur? I mentioned the uh, sound rate design. We think it can be sleeved into a uh, a good a beneficial electric rate. Uh, doesn't. Uh, require some creativity from our utilities, but they've already demonstrated that they're able to kind of handle this and manage it. Uh, Burlington's an example. I know you're not powered looking at that as, as well. There are potentially complications for some of our smaller systems that don't have some of the infrastructure that our larger systems have, but so there might have to be some accommodation there. Why now? Uh, because as we talked about earlier, um, we're really just getting started with electric vehicles. It's much easier to get this kind of neatly dealt with at the early stages than it is to kind of wait another five or seven years when there actually are a significant volume of vehicles uh, out there that are suddenly going to feel the impact of a extra charge. Uh, better to sleeve it in as we're talking about rate design. So we uh, do it all, we make the improvements and the adjustments all at one time so that customers see the benefits, they don't necessarily see the downside uh, effects of making that change. Demand charges, I heard that you all were interested in the topic of demand charges. Uh, just issued a report uh, last, last week on demand charges. Uh, we introduced the concept of, uh, at least uh, relative to, um, uh, uh, to uh, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, especially if they are high, uh, voltage DC charging stations can potentially have be adversely impacted by uh, high demand charges. That, that creates a problem for all of us if, as we want to move this uh, electric vehicles uh, forward because high operating costs for them uh, means that the economic case for kind of in, uh, creating new stations is going to be adversely impacted. We, we think there's a sensible way that doesn't adversely impact other customers of essentially making some reforms to demand charges so that we uh, address both the needs of these uh, stations and um, and the uh, the system uh, to not adversely impact uh, the system and other other ratepayers. Uh, design, uh, demand charges are designed to do just that. So it's not yeah. have charges. Yeah. No. So I. Yeah. But the, the demand chart, this is, this is real, uh, this, so we wrote a 25 page report. Uh, this is, I, I could honestly spend an hour and then some talking about this. But uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting getting rid of them. I'm su suggesting reforming uh, how we apply them. So we have more surgically targeted the costs that they drive rather than uh, uh, do it in, I'm mean, really talking about a more efficient pricing signal uh, rather than the, uh, what I think is a, uh, a, a relatively uh, broad brush approach to dealing with, uh, with the issue. But these big fast chargers during peak hours, mm -hmm. they're in use, they're going to seem? There are, there are options available. They could install a battery. If, if you could surgically okay. kind of, okay. if you could surgically, uh, you know, uh, identify the hours. What's that? Then that doesn't, that's just, what you just said wouldn't necessarily change the rate design. It probably does. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that you, uh, an example would be offering, uh, you know, uh, applying a, a demand charge, maybe offering them a, a dynamic uh, credit for uh, interrupting their uh, charging, meaning uh, they use a local battery uh, system to essentially charge their station and their electric vehicles for an hour 
while the system is experiencing either a monthly peak or an annual peak. So there are there are workarounds, and uh, you know, very very broadly, it's 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 about creating potentially uh, uh, retail price riders or other dynamic mechanisms that utilities, Green Mountain Power is already kind of thinking about and, and applying. And I'll pursue this with you. Yeah. Off, off that. Happy to talk about that. Uh, and, and there is a report. Uh, and this is, I think, my last slide before I get into questions. Uh, but this just gives you a sense of, of the loads. Uh, we built up our system. Uh, historically, loads were uh, growing uh, two, uh, three, three uh, percent. wasn't until about kind of 2009 or uh, 10 that we started to realize, oh, geez, uh, loads aren't really materializing. Lots of reasons uh, for that. Our, our forecasts going forward have uh, seemed to suggest a significant growth in electric vehicles. But in terms of the overall load growth, the loads are actually fairly high. This is actually over a 20 uh, year horizon. We're not yet achieving, even with significant loads, assuming the worst possible load shapes, you know, basically current load shapes uh, are continued to apply. We're still not even kind of you, uh, uh, building to the peak that we hit historically in 2006. So there's, there's a lot of headroom uh, there on our system to uh, allow electric in golly gee, if we can just manage those loads through efficient rate design, you know we can do we, we can accomplish much more for consumers to integrate renewables to integrate uh, electric vehicles and other loads. Uh, a lot of good things. That's that's kind of it. I I, I mean this is kind of a visual of, of that uh, relative to the region. Historic peaks. What you see is loads just didn't materialize relative to what we were forecasting. This is kind of where we are and where we're looking uh, going forward. With energy efficiency, they're uh, going to be uh, continue to contribute. And uh, these other slides are just to show you just how flexible these loads are and how they can kind of be managed through effective rate design. People are very responsive to the price signal that uh, they're set. I'll stop there. Okay. Questions for Riley. If you go back to your why now slide that has the, the curve about revenue adoption, I just wanted to, to because we're the we're concerned about the transportation fund in here of first and foremost. Um, so if we got to a hundred thousand EVs, so that's like a quarter of our light duty vehicle fleet in the state, the net revenue impact if we did nothing, if we charged them nothing, is this really saying it would be between one point five and one point eight million dollars a year? Um. Am I reading that right? Uh, I, I might have to uh, defer to Michelle on this one. I think this is her slide. So, um. Well, actually, I don't think it's my slide. So <laughs> I, I okay. haven't studied it, and okay. uh, I'd have to study it to yeah, say that. That, that would, would be great to really understand. Yeah, let me, let me get back to you. A lot of the reason you're here and yeah. we structured this this way was to because there's this anxiety about EVs. And I think what, what I'm taking away from this is that the impact on the transportation fund is next. Well, it's two million dollars if we hit a hundred thousand and do nothing. So I think what it is right now is only maybe two hundred thousand dollars a year, and so I'm much more concerned with not having enough EV adoption than I am about its impact on the T fund in the short term. The long term, absolutely. Well, we, we think we think transportation fund issue needs to be addressed, and we want to address it in, at the front end. And uh, we kind of have received that me we received that message very clearly over the last couple of years and we've internalized it and we think that's an important step in kind of making pro progress on electric vehicles. In your earlier charts, um, that have the cost uh, per kilowatt hour, do you have in there a charge for I don't know what you might call it, the road usage? That's the green area on that, uh, on that left hand bar. But when you said that was the T fund, that's what you meant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and is that roughly what that same vehicle that has size for the pay and gas Yes. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Yeah, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. So, Riley, there's two questions that came up uh, before, uh, before you were here. Yeah. Uh, Dave and Connie were interested in what uh, what did, and build out 
50,000 cars or whatever, what we're trying to do, how is that going to look physically? How many charging stations do you envision are going to happen? And my question was, how, how does it look for um, meeting that boat, our electrical system now in the, in the state? How, we, how do we meet that boat, which is not there now? So, so it's the kind of the same, similar questions. How does it look in the future? I, I mean, I, I can kind of, I, I can only speak in kind of general. I mean, we have 200, uh, 209 uh, stations currently. Uh, most of the charging that occurs, at least currently, is, is at home. So 85% of the electric vehicle charging is at home. I expect that in the future, most of the charging is probably going to be at home or in the, the workplace. Uh, as, uh, as the, the future kind of un unfolds, I, I suspect that what we're going to see is uh, we're going to gravitate probably to more fast charging stations. Uh, the relatively uh, high volume DC fast charging level three uh, stations, and we're going to need a, a fair number of those in the right places. Uh, and that's also kind of a rate design uh, issue, and we're trying to kind of motivate that through our use of VW funds and uh, other other things. Um, it, there, in, in my mind, there are potential strains on our our electric system. It's going to be relatively location specific. Our system it, it, at the bulk transmission level has, in my mind, is, is never really going to be adversely impacted by. Uh, 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 transportation. I mean, it's, we're going to manage those loads. The only sensible way to do this is to manage those loads. Even if we didn't manage those loads, in the, within the next 20 years, it doesn't look like there's there's much risk that there's going to be mass adverse impact. But if you put a high voltage DC charging station that is uh, essentially pulling in electricity at 350 uh, kW, that's a lot of uh, juice that. Uh, is needed, that, that could strain the system. And that's where Bill Jordan might be able to help us further. Can you add anything to, to what I just said? I, I can add a little bit. I, mean, okay. I, I completely agree with your assessment of the bulk transmission system. And where there may be issues, if there are any, would be down at the local system. And the individual utilities on the distribution system would need to assess that. If they know the charging stations are getting built, they can plan for that. They also even if they didn't and the load surprised them, they would see it on their monitoring system that there's an increased load there and could plan for infrastructure upgrades on individual circuits. It would be a local effect, not a, not a statewide effect. But I take it when we remember that we are electrifying station quite a bit and we are adding a tremendous amount of air conditioning that just didn't even exist. Before the heat pumps, so now everybody has air conditioning because it's okay with the heat pump. So um, when we remember that, and then to have a high portion, a large portion of our transportation be electrified, including with fast charging, and I this is the first I've heard of the wattage, 350 kW, 350 kW, at 480 volts. That's tremendous. That's, that's why I question how how we're going to deal with that peak in that. Um, we're not supplying electricity for such a load today. Where is the electricity going to come from? Well, the, the source of electricity the, the can margin, be the, the additional electricity. Uh, are you asking about the source of electricity yeah. or the, no, uh, the source, yes. capacity to deliver it? Both. Both. The, the source of electricity uh, would be purchased on the ISO New England market if the utilities didn't have their own uh, contracts or their own generation. And ISO New England has some headroom on its system in terms of generation. In terms of the capacity to deliver it on the local distribution circuits, they're all different. And it would be some, some have a lot of capacity on them now, some don't. And we're seeing this with solar projects which is the opposite problem of exporting electricity instead of importing electricity, that 
some solar projects, there are so many on the circuit that it's approaching the capacity of the substation. And as that, if that would happen with electric vehicles, the utility would be aware of it and would need to upgrade the transformer or other aspects of its substation, or maybe even the wires on its system. Mr. Chairman, I mean, in my mind, there, I mean, it's kind of exciting because uh, you know I'm an economist, and uh, you know I think the elegant solution is actually pricing, and I, I think there's a way. I mean, if you imagine, <clears throat> these are new loads, but they don't necessarily require kind of all the electrons to flow for, uh, up, from upstream central station generators. Increasingly, the system is shifting to a world in which the generation is ha happening locally. You can well imagine within the household. The wire system may not even see the flow of uh, electricity. You may have a, uh, a PV panel on your roof. You have an electric vehicle in your house. You may have a Tesla power wall on the, uh, the house. What, what the system is going to need to address is kind of the residual loads uh, when the, you know, all that isn't kind of being managed in, internally. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily uh, lead to, and uh, to the extent that uh, you can pr uh, get the distribution company to think in terms of locational incentives, uh, uh, other rate design solutions. You can kind of rationalize things without necessarily kind of building, uh, building up the system, overbuilding the system, I would say. Uh, because what we have, we, we have automatically coming in kind of 70% 70, uh, 70 load factor. So that means kind of 30% of our system is uh, being underutilized. At the regional level, it's more like 46% of our uh, system is, is kind of underutilized. Uh, no, I mean, uh, I mean the difference between the capacity of our system is that is 100% uh, load factor being all the energy uh, being used, all the loads are essentially uh, matching the, the generation all the time, and there isn't any kind of difference between the, uh, the bricks and mortar and the wire system and uh, the loads. We're just using the system at 100% uh, efficiency, uh, or it is uh, at full capacity, essentially, all, all the time. Right now, we're using the system at, you know, about, uh, at the regional level, it's, it's something like 53, 54%. Within Vermont, we're much higher. We, we have much better load factors. It's in the neighborhood of 7%. So we have we have some flexibility to move loads around to help smooth those those loads, uh, and that creates potentially a lot of headroom. Okay, uh, I do want to break the committee, so uh, I'm going to pursue this with mine. I'm actually, uh, frankly, not satisfied with the answers. I want to okay. pursue it with you. All right. I, I'd like to talk to you offline. I'd like to, yep. uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Riley? He's coming back sometime. Yeah, you're going to go back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I will have questions as we get more into this. Because yep. uh, as to how, if they're going to have to upgrade, if your local distribution company is going to have to upgrade, um, they, of course, obviously they're going to know ahead of time. But they still have to go through all the uh, PC hearings and all of this other thing. And, and the question, do the rate payers of that utility pay for an upgrade? Because I, Brian Savage, want to put in a huge charging station commercially. So, yeah, and all that comes inside. I've got questions around Yeah, they're good questions that. and they require good answers, and I'll try to do a better job in the future. I don't mean to criticize your answers. <laughs> I'm satisfied. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I sat on the board. Yeah.